Slum 1200 GGI Mob and I'm back. Slum 1200 GGI Mob and I'm back. Slum 1200 GGI Mob and I'm back. I'm back, back. I get that bag for real. I'm trying to stash a meal. I get your smash for real. I'm still in the trap for real. Got pressure, got grounds for real. Got purse, got zans for real. Put my man on your man's for real. Put an end of his plans for real. Man, these rap niggas be straight capping. Always talking about shooters. But when a nigga catch him down bad, they be begging like, please don't shoot me. But stay in your lane. This shit ain't a game, man. Niggas dying for it. In the hood, trap slinging nine for it. Up that road, Joseph doing time for it. In your in your business, which was mainly based at, which was totally based in Chicago, did you ever envision that you would one day um, have connection with people who were his ma major suppliers, the uh, Margarito and Pedro Flores, who were uh, called the twins and and are also uh, convicted uh, on a drug uh, conspiracy charge? On the now infamous Flores twins have family trouble on the horizon. Just as they are thought to be out of prison and into witness protection, the brothers from Little Village were largely responsible for information that led to the federal takedown of cartel kingpin El Chapo. Now federal prosecutors are turning the screws in a money laundering case against both Flores wives and other relatives. Olivia and Mia Flores. The twins' wives are lead defendants in a federal money laundering case and have pleaded not guilty to an alleged scheme in Chicago and elsewhere that saw millions in cartel drug profits hidden from authorities. This money laundering case against the wives has been simmering even as their husbands, the Flores twins, worked their way through relatively short prison sentences after cooperating against Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, longtime leader of the feared Sinaloa cartel in Mexico. Tonight, the I-Team has learned Pedro Flores' sister-in-law will appear this Thursday in federal court to change her plea. Bianca Finnegan is charged in the money laundering case and is expected to plead guilty to her alleged role in the hiding of drug proceeds. 32-year-old Finnegan will be the second defendant in the Flores wives case to cut a deal with prosecutors and avoid a criminal trial. Last week, the Flores twins' older brother Armando pleaded guilty to helping collect millions in drug deal proceeds and then burying the cash in Texas under his back porch. With El Chapo locked up for life and the Flores twins believed to be in witness protection, this news of yet another plea deal in the case against their wives undoubtedly comes as a blow to their reality TV careers that was just taking off. No comment from federal authorities tonight, no reply from Finnegan's attorney also, so the details of her prospective plea agreement are not known. And no comment tonight from the attorney representing the twin's brother, Armando Flores. Although federal prosecutors have indicated they would recommend a reduced sentence for him if he continues to cooperate with investigators. So my question is, does it surprise you that your relatively small case led, according to prosecutors, led them up the ladder to the twins and eventually to prosecuting El Chapo? In other words, they say there's a... a I think uh, Chapo Guzman is the number one bad guy of our generation. Jack Riley was raised in the South Suburbs. Another great day for the good guys at Chicago. But caught the attention of Mexico's biggest drug lord more than a decade ago. Going after organized crime. Through his work with the Drug Enforcement Administration, it was on Riley's watch that federal agents arrested and flipped twin brothers from Chicago's Little Village neighborhood. Pedro and Margarito Flores were El Chapo's biggest distributors here in the Midwest. They used stash houses in the suburbs and modified vehicles to keep the pipeline line of drugs flowing from Mexico to Chicago. In the pantheon of drug prosecutions in the history of the Northern District of Illinois, this case stands at the highest level. 
At trial, Pedro Flores testified he and his brother visited El Chapo in a remote area of Mexico where they saw a naked dead man chained to a tree, a reminder that those who cross the cartel rarely live to talk about it. Certainly, uh, the Flores brothers cooperating and providing all the information, uh, uh, literally in tons of cocaine and billions of dollars, and then, quite frankly, getting Chapo for the first time on a court-authorized wiretap where he's negotiating for kilos of heroin. Um, so I, I think it was the most crucial evidence of the trial. Under heavy security in 2015, a federal judge here in Chicago sentenced the Flores brothers to 14 years in prison. Back then, the U.S. attorney noted the risk their cooperation carries. There is never a day in their lives where they won't have to look over their shoulder. The judge said in court this morning, there's never a car time that they'll turn the ignition switch on a car and not wonder to themselves, is it going to start or is it going to blow up? That's its own form of life sentence, and that's a part of the extraordinary nature of this case. They say there's a straight line between your case and, and the Chicago indictment against Chapo. Basically, I should never have had Why did you not cooperate with the feds when they had you? Cooperate was never my vocabulary. I don't agree with setting somebody up or cooperating to get somebody else in trouble who might not even be in trouble. And I was told I'm totally against it. Because when all this is over, I can go downtown to Beckham Fountain, take a picture at 11 o'clock at night. I don't have to worry about we're going to put a bullet in the back of my head. I can live comfortable after this. I didn't get anyone in any trouble. So the twins, who were Chapo's biggest customers in the United States, only got 14 years in prison because of their uh, cooperation. You wound up with 20 years in prison. You've said that you thought that was an unfair sentence. Why do you think that? Well, I only technically have 300 grams of heroin on my case total. That's it. They used the testimonies of other people run my drug amount up to allow me to get to a year. It's never fair because they basically I don't cooperate. They throw the throw the book at me. They cooperate and they had actual drugs from their case, actual hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of keys. And they still only get fourteen years. What's interesting to me, one of the things that's interesting to me about you and your case is uh, your family background. I mean, you essentially had a middle class upbringing in Maywood. Your uh, parents owned a grocery store um, on the west side. Your dad drove a bus, a CTA bus. They looked out. Uh, they, they did the best they could to um, provide for you and your, your brothers. Uh, you wound up going to a good school, uh, St. Joseph, um, in the suburbs. And um, yet, and you had opportunities to, to, to get into the quote unquote square world and, and become a you know a middle class guy, but you, you opted to do the the uh, drug trafficking route or drug dealing route. Why did you do that? And looking back on it, would you have done it again? No, I would have done it again because at the end of the day it's not it's not worth it. It's not worth the time, the headache. Um the reason I'm seeing why I probably feel that way because a lot of my friends I grew up with, you know I went to a good school things like that. A lot of my friends was, you know, went the other way and you kinda like one you see what's going on. It's not you selling drugs is not hard. It's basically simple math. You see who wanted it and you know who has it to give it to somebody. So it wasn't it's like the temptation of you see it around you all the time. It's fast money. It's just simple math not realizing the risk of it because you're so young. You don't realize that, you know, you you are you are ruining lives of people you know, just using the drugs and things like that. And, and you can't hurt the community because, you know, the, the, the drug users, they do what they got to do to get them off the drugs. You never think about those type of things. So if I could take it back, I would take it back. And I don't have to really necessarily complete college to be successful. I could own a Fortune 500 company without going to school, but that would have been a big help, you know, of my success in life just going to college. A lot of people look at People like you who are mid-level drug dealers and higher who, you know, are intelligent businessmen in that field but believe that 
you got you could have been an intelligent businessman in another field. Do you agree with that? That's correct. That's correct. All right. That's totally correct. All right. Sounds like you're getting beeped. Does that mean you have to go? Yeah. For ten seconds left, we got to call you back in like thirty minutes. Okay. Thanks, Chris. The Sinaloa cartel was personally directed by billionaire drug lord Joaquin El Chapo Guzman until his jailing in the U.S. last year. But that group is still responsible for 80% of the street drug sales in Chicago, according to law enforcement. Now federal investigators say cartel operatives deployed money movers to Chicago, collecting bulk cash from drug sales, and then they allegedly deposited the bulk into domestic bank accounts set up through a web of funnel banks. Authorities say coke conspirators then made international wire transfers to Mexican bank accounts that the cartel could access. During the investigation that culminated early this year, federal agents seized more than six million dollars and 1130 pounds of methamphetamine, heroin, fentanyl, cocaine, and marijuana, along with 20 guns, including semi-automatic assault rifles and pistols. Federal prosecutors in San Diego say cartel money movers smuggled hundreds of thousands of dollars in drug proceeds at a time some stashed in secret hidden compartments in vehicles, as the I-Team first uncovered in late 2015, so-called traps that look like they're a normal part of the interior. And federal agents say the cash handoffs occurred in public parking lots right out in the open, a similar encounter occurring in August 2016 outside Lewis Joliet Mall, southwest of Chicago. On that day, federal drug agents were also on the scene, and a ferocious shootout went down. Get out of line, I guarantee gon' flush him.